Hi, my name is Ken Vandevald. I'm professor of law at Thomas Jefferson School of Law. And the purpose of this video is to talk to you about how to write a really good law school exam answer. This is a question that I've actually spent a lot of time thinking about. And in fact, a while back, I wrote this book, Thinking Like a Lawyer, in which I delved into this question, although in a lot more detail than we'll have time for today in this video. Now, before we start talking about how to write your answer, I'd like you to think about a law school exam question from the perspective of your instructor, the person who's going to write the question and the person who's going to grade your answer. Now, from your instructor's perspective, the purpose of the law school exam question, and this may seem obvious, is to test you on what you've learned in law school. And what you've learned is how to use legal rules to determine the legal consequences of events that happen in the world. Now, legal rules can do this for us because a legal rule is really just a statement that when certain facts occur, some legal consequence results. So, for example, we may have a rule that says that the legal consequence of liability for a battery arises whenever someone acts in such a way as to intentionally cause someone else to be offensively touched. Now, these facts that must occur for the legal consequence to result are known as the elements of the rule. And what your instructor will want you to do is to examine a set of facts to determine whether the elements of the various rules you've learned in the course are present, and in that way to determine whether or not the legal consequences arise. Uh, so as this indicates, what you're likely to be tested on and evaluated on is two things. First, your knowledge of the rules of law that you've learned, and then second, your skill at applying those rules of law to a set of facts. This is the skill that we often refer to as thinking like a lawyer. So now that we know what your instructor is looking for, um, I'd like to talk to you about how to write an answer that your instructor will like. I'll talk about what you should do, and I'll also talk about five common mistakes that you should avoid. Now, uh, the exam question that you're going to be handed will likely consist of two parts. First, there will be a, a written narrative, a set of facts, and then second, there will be a directive of some sort that tells you to talk about certain legal consequences of those facts. Uh, so, for example, in a torts exam, and I'll use torts as my example because it deals with common everyday factual situations. On a torts exam, you may be given a narrative about some character, a column Tom, who wonders about wreaking havoc wherever he goes. Then at the end of the narrative, there will be a directive asking you to discuss whether Tom has committed any torts, that is, any wrongful injuries to persons or property. Now, when you receive this question, the first thing, obviously, you're going to do is you're going to read the question. And the first time you read it, you're probably going to want to read it much like a novel. You want to figure out who the characters are and what the plot is. Who did what to whom, how, when, where, and why. At the end, you will find out then what legal consequences you're looking for. Now go back and read it a second time. And, and now that you know what the central issue is, which is whether Tom committed any torts, you're going to be looking for rules that address that issue and the elements of which may be present in the facts that you've been given. And as you go through looking for the elements of various rules, I want you to look especially for what I'll call distinctive elements. Uh, these are elements that are distinctive to or peculiar to a particular rule. For example, we have a rule that defines false imprisonment. And a false imprisonment arises only where someone is confined to a bounded area. And this is not an element of any other rule. So if you see facts that suggest possibly that someone has been confined to a bounded area, this is a good sign that your instructor wants you to talk about false imprisonment. If you don't see any facts that even remotely suggest a confinement to a bounded area, then there's some indication that your instructor probably doesn't expect you to talk about false imprisonment. Now, as you go through looking for these various elements, you're going to want to create a list. And the list is, uh, contains the, the rules that you think uh, might have elements present in the facts. Then under each of the rules, you want to list the facts that indicate that perhaps the elements are there or they're not there. And this list is going to provide the outline for the answer that you're going to write. Now, as you're putting together this, this list of rules and facts, you have the opportunity to make the first of the five common mistakes that law students make. And that's the mistake 
of incompleteness. You will fail to mention some fact that should be mentioned or some legal principle that should be mentioned. Now the cure for uh, incompleteness, the way to prevent it, is to be systematic uh, in your approach to the law and the facts. So let's go back to the facts for a moment. You've already read them twice. Now I want you to read them a third time. And on this third reading, I want you to think about them from the perspective of the instructor who wrote them. Remember that no fact appears in the question by accident. There's no autofill software sticking them into the question as the, as the instructor writes them. You know, your instructor could be home uh, relaxing in an easy chair, watching an HBO original series on TV, favorite beverage at the elbow. But no, your instructor is sitting in a cramped little office surrounded by books and papers laboriously thinking of these facts and sticking them into the question. So they're all there for a reason. Your job is to figure out what that reason is. Now, some of the facts are there just to structure the narrative. Without them, the, the narrative would be an incoherent babble of details. Those you can probably ignore. There are also facts that may be red herrings. A red herring is a smelly fish that, according to legend, was dragged across the trail to throw the bloodhound off of a scent. Um, and in the same way, law professors will sometimes stick uh, facts that are irrelevant into the question, hoping we can trick you into thinking they're relevant and thereby throw you off the path that you should be on. You, you can and should ignore those as well. But most of the facts aren't going to be red herrings. Most of the facts um, are going to be put there to, to create arguments, either that an element is present or an element is not present. And your job is to figure out why each fact is there. And keep in mind that one fact might be used in more than one setting. It might be relevant to more than one rule or more than one element of a rule. By the end of your review of the facts, you should have a pretty good idea of why every fact is there, and you should know why you've left out whatever facts you're not going to talk about and how you're going to use those facts that you are going to talk about. Now, after you finish this systematic review of the facts, I want you to do the same thing with the law. Well before you walk into the exam room, you should have written yourself an outline of the entire course, um, an outline that contains all of the rules that you've learned and you should have committed that outline to memory. Now, as part of your memory process, memorization process, you may well have reduced uh, the outline to a one or two page summary, uh, something that allows you to kind of envision the entire course at once in your mind to see all of the parts and to see how they fit together. Think of this as a sort of a course at a glance. You need to, now that you've mastered the facts, Think through that course at a glance and understand why you have or have not included every part of your outline in your answer. You need to understand why a rule will or will not be discussed in your answer. Now, when you finish this systematic review of the law and facts, and keep in mind, you're going to want to include every rule, the elements of which are at least arguably present. When you finish this systematic review of the law and facts, um, you're ready to write your answer. Now, a lot of students have trouble figuring out how to start their answer. Uh, they might begin, for example, by writing a paragraph that summarizes all of the facts that they've been given, or they might write a paragraph that's like a little mini treatise on the subject, the history of the subject, how it fits in with other subjects. All of these things are examples of the second common mistake that law students make. And that's the mistake of irrelevance. They talk about material that should not belong uh, in the answer. You know what the issue is on this exam. The issue is whether Tom committed any torts. So every word that you write should be directed to that issue. If something you write is not directed to that issue, um, then it's irrelevant. And you're going to receive no credit for it at all, no matter how brilliant it is, no matter how beautifully written, no matter how humorous to contemplate. None of that matters. If it's irrelevant, you're not going to receive any credit. All you're going to do is waste your very precious time and maybe annoy your instructor. If you don't start with some kind of introductory paragraph, how do you start? Well, that's an easy question to answer. Law schools throughout the country have all agreed on the format we're looking for. It's a format that has a name. We call it IRAC. IRAC is an acronym. It consists of four letters, I, R, A, and C, and C, and stands for Issue, Rule, Application, and Conclusion. And these, these are the steps of your law school exam answer. Um, if you follow the IRAC format, you will avoid the third common mistake the law students make, the mistake of disorganization. 
So the first part of the IRAC format is the issue. Um, how do we begin with the issue? Well, you have your outline, your list of rules that you think maybe have, may have elements present in the facts, and you need to go to that list now and choose a rule to begin to discuss. Uh, some students may start with the one that's earliest chronologically in the facts or the easiest or the hardest. Usually the order doesn't matter. Pick a rule, and let's say you're gonna pick the rule of battery. So your first issue then is whether or not Tom has committed a battery. You begin writing by writing the word battery. You underline it, creating a heading. You start a new paragraph, and you write what's gonna be the first sentence in your exam. And that first sentence is, the first issue is whether Tom committed a battery. Um, uh, having written that, you've now completed the I part of the analysis. Now you move on to the R part of the analysis. You start a, a new paragraph, and you write what's going to be your second sentence. And your second sentence um, is the rule that defines a battery, the rule that I enunciated at the beginning of this video. Uh, now, it's when you're stating the rule that you have the chance to make the fourth common mistake that law students make, and that's the mistake of inaccuracy. They state the rule incorrectly. They include elements that don't belong. They leave elements out that should be there. They misstate elements. Um, and this is a serious problem for two reasons. First, your instructor may be giving you credit for stating the rule. If you state the rule incorrectly, you're going to lose some or all of that credit. But second and more important is the fact that as you're about to see, that rule structures the entire rest of your answer. If the rule is wrong, then the rest of your answer is going to be wrong. So uh, it, uh, it's important that you know the rule. You don't have any way of controlling uh, what facts the instructor is going to give you on the exam, but you do have the ability to control your knowledge of the law. So take control and make sure that before you walk into the exam, you know the rules that you've learned in the course. Now, um, the third part of the analysis is the application part. Um, and in that third part, you're going to discuss whether or not each of the elements of the rule is present. So just as you had to choose uh, some issue to begin with, now you're going to have to choose some element to start with. You've got several elements of the rule, and pick one. And let's say you choose the element of the touching. You want to write the word touching. You want to underline it, creating a heading, start a new paragraph. And just as you began your discussion of the issue of battery with a rule that tells us what a battery is, ideally you should start your discussion of the element of a touching with a rule that tells us what a touching is. So you may have learned some rule like a touching occurs where there's contact with the person or something closely identified with the person, some rule like that. And if you have such a rule, start your discussion with that. And then you're gonna to wanna to talk about those facts that indicate that the touching did occur and then those facts that maybe indicate that a touching did not occur. And you're going to want to reach some kind of resolution um, about whether there's a touching. Now, it's at this point in the exam that students have the chance to commit their fifth common mistake, and that's the mistake of being conclusory. Um, they'll sometimes, and this often happens when it's obvious to them that some element is present, and they'll think that it's so obvious they really don't need to talk about it. They think it's almost like it's insulting to the instructor to, to have to point it out. So, uh, 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 so they'll, they'll write something like, uh, uh, in this case, uh, it's obvious that a touching occurs. So, you know, you may have an, a, a situation, for example, where Tom has just buried an ax in the forehead of the plaintiff, and the student thinks there can't possibly be any doubt about, about, the, uh, about the existence of a touching. But you never want to write a conclusion on an exam that is not supported by facts and by law. You always want to identify the law and the facts that when taken together yield the conclusion. Um, now, as this example indicates, there will be times when it's obvious that an element is met. Thomas sunk an ax in the forehead of the plaintiff. There is no doubt that there's been a touching at trial. Tom is not going to seriously contest that. Um, it's not an issue at trial. It's not going to be a major issue on the exam. In those situations, you want to spend very little time on that element. Just state the facts that, in, uh, that indicate that the element's present, avoid being conclusory, but be brief, and move on. Now, in other situations, it won't be so clear whether an element is present. Uh, you know, Tom, for example, at trial may concede that he sunk the uh, ax into the forehead of the plaintiff, 
But he says, you know, look, I may have done that, but I never intended to do that. You know, I was just practicing my axe throwing routine for my appearance on America's Got Talent, and I didn't mean to hit the plaintiff. And there may be all kinds of facts in the question about where the plaintiff was standing, where Tom was standing, what Tom knew at the time, how skilled Tom was at throwing the axe, et cetera, et cetera. And these facts may give you the ability to argue that Tom did intend or did not intend to hit the plaintiff. And when you have a situation like that, this is really a gold mine for you. This is your chance to really use the facts in a thorough way to show that you can think like a lawyer, that you can use the facts to construct arguments about why the elements are, are or are not satisfied. Um, you may have read a case in class uh, that involves similar or analogous facts, and if so, you can bring that case into your discussion and you can, you can argue by analogy that because the facts of the other case are similar to the facts in the exam question, the result in the exam question should be similar to the result in the, in the case that you've read. Now, when you've finished talking about uh, the element, uh, you will want to conclude um, and move on to the next element. Write uh, a, a heading identifying that element, underline it, start a new paragraph, and move on um, and discuss that element in just the same way you discussed the first one. Now, I want to pause here for a moment and say something about my penchant for headings and paragraphs. It's not essential that you write all these headings, but it's a really good idea. The reason is that the headings signal to your instructor the organization of your answer and by identifying the various issues and elements of the rules they also allow your instructor to see how complete your answer is. Uh, even if you don't use headings you should at least use paragraph breaks whenever you introduce a new issue or a new rule or a new element or a conclusion so that your instructor can follow your answer so your instructor can appreciate the, the quality of what you've, what you've written. All right, now after you've discussed every element uh, of, of, the, of the rule, you're going to want to conclude uh, your discussion of that issue. Now a lot of students have trouble with the conclusion. They're not sure what to write because they're not sure whether the rule has been satisfied or not. Maybe it's not clear that one of the elements was met and so they don't really know whether the battery occurred or, or didn't. Uh, in a situation like this, all you can do is use your best judgment. Just evaluate the arguments for and against that you've laid out and decide which you think is the better argument and reach that conclusion. The most important thing is to be sure that the conclusion is consistent with the discussion that you've had up to that point. Keep in mind that law school exam questions are often written so that more than one conclusion is possible. And in that situation, the likelihood is that some of your colleagues will have reached one conclusion and others will have reached the other conclusion. A and the highest grade is not going to go to the students who accurately predict what conclusion the instructor thinks the court would likely reach. Instead, the highest grade is going to go to those students who are able to discuss the law and the facts thoroughly, correctly, logically, and in an organized manner. Too many students think that the goal of the exam is simply to, to reach a conclusion. And so they rush through the elements as fast as they can, ticking them off one by one until they reach the goal and they sort of spike a metaphorical football, raise their arms in triumph, and they declare the conclusion to what they imagine is the applause of their instructor. Now someone who does that, who rushes through the question, maybe has written a competent answer, but they've not written an answer that excels. Remember. The purpose of this exam is to test you on your knowledge of the law and your ability to think like a lawyer. That is, to interweave the law that you've learned with the facts that you've been given to create and evaluate arguments about whether certain legal consequences will or will not result from the facts that you've been given. I hope that this video has been helpful to you. Um, if you'd like to explore these ideas more, take a look at my book, Thinking Like a Lawyer. Thank you very much.